Hello everyone and welcome to the 12th lecture from our signal theory class. In this lecture you will learn about discretization. Discretization is a process of turning a continuous time system into a discrete time system. Why do we need such things? Well, for example, we use it in the design of discrete time IIR filters. Before digital IIR filters became common, people used continuous time analog filters and developed nice procedures for their design. Today, when I want to design a discrete time digital IIR filter, I can still utilize what was developed for continuous time filters. I first design an analog filter with a desired frequency characteristic and then I transform it into a discrete time filter while keeping the frequency characteristic. This transformation is called discretization. Another example where you can use discretization is in the control system design. Modern control systems are often digital and work in discrete time while they control continuous time analog systems. A trivial example could be the inverse pendulum I showed you. This inverse pendulum is a continuous time analog system, but it is controlled by a microcontroller, which is a digital discrete time system. When I design or analyze a system that contains both discrete time and continuous time, I need to have everything in either continuous time or discrete time. So I may need to discretize the time continuous portion of the system and turn it into a discrete system. Or alternatively, I could design everything in continuous time and then discretize the regulator that needs to run on the discrete time microcontroller. Now, how do I perform this discretization? How do I turn a continuous time system into a discrete time system? Well, a continuous time LTI system will be described by a differential equation or by an impulse response or by a transfer function. To turn this system into a discrete system, I first need to sample all the continuous time signals and then, according to the type of description I have, I can approximate derivative with a discrete time operations or I can sample the impulse response and turn it into a discrete one or I can transform the zeros and poles of the continuous time transfer function and create a new discrete time transfer function. On the next slides, we will examine all of these alternatives and we will start with the approximation of the derivative. If in the continuous time system I have a derivative, then I somehow need to approximate this continuous time operation with a discrete time operation. To do this, I need to realize that the derivative of a continuous time function u of t at a selected point is the slope of the line tangent to the function u of t at that selected point. If my signal u of t is sampled with sampling period t sub s, I get only these blue samples and I need to use these samples to somehow approximate that continuous time derivative. One possibility to approximate the derivative, that is the slope of this line, is with the slope of the line passing through the points at discrete times n, and n plus 1. The slope of this dashed line can be computed very easily in discrete time like this, and this approximation we call the forward difference. So to do the discretization, you could take the differential equation of the system and wherever you find the derivative, you would replace it with this expression. But typically we do not do it like this. Instead, we do it in the Laplace domain and Z domain. So let's see how this works in the Laplace domain. The Laplace transform of this equation with zero initial conditions is this. The Z transform of this equation with zero initial conditions is this, which can be simplified into this. Now, when you compare this equation and this equation, you can see that multiplication by s now changed into the multiplication by this expression. In time domain, this operation is equivalent to using this approximation of a derivative. So to do the forward difference, I can take the transfer function in the Laplace domain, make this substitution, which will give me the transfer function in the z domain. 
In the time domain, this substitution is equivalent to using this approximation of a derivative. Now I have other options. Instead of using the sample at discrete times n and n plus 1, I can use samples at times n and n minus 1 and approximate the slope of this line by the slope of the line passing through these two points. Mathematically, I can write it like this and this operation we call the backward difference. In the z domain, this operation becomes this which you can simplify into this. So when you compare this equation and this one, you can see that when here I multiply by s, after the backward difference discretization, I need to multiply by this expression. So to turn the Laplace domain description of the derivative into the z domain description of a derivative, I need to substitute this expression for s. So to do the backward difference, I can take the transfer function in the Laplace domain, make this substitution, which will give me the transfer function in the z domain. In the time domain, this substitution is equivalent to using this approximation of a derivative. Now, you can see that these approximations are going to result in some error. In this case, the approximated derivative is going to be smaller than the true one. And in this case, the approximated derivative is going to be bigger than the true one. What could I do to improve the precision of this approximation? I can do this. I will try to use the slope of this line passing through these two points to estimate the average of the derivatives at this point and at this point. You can see that the slope of this dashed line will be closer to the average of the slopes of these two solid lines than to the slope of either of the solid lines. Mathematically, I can write it like this. This is the average of derivatives at positions n and n minus 1, and this is the slope of this dashed line. This approximation of the derivative we call the bilinear transform, or it sometimes goes under the name Tustin transform. When I apply the z-transform to this equation, I get this, which can be simplified into this. So here, instead of multiplication by s, I have multiplication by this expression. So to turn the Laplace domain description of the derivative into the z-domain description of a derivative, I need to substitute this expression for s. So to do the bilinear transform, I can take the transfer function in the Laplace domain, make this substitution, which will give me the transfer function in the z domain. In the time domain, this substitution is equivalent to using this approximation of a derivative. Let's take a look at an example where I used the bilinear transform to discretize this time continuous system. I will use this sampling frequency, which will give me this sampling period. First, I need to compute the Laplace transform and find the transfer function. Now I will use the bilinear transform, which means that for s, I will substitute this expression. So here I have my transfer function and here I make the substitution. This expression I can crunch and simplify into this one, which will be the transfer function of my discrete time system. In this transfer function, I can identify the coefficients of the system and write the differential equation. Or I could use these coefficients and implement the discrete system in MATLAB. So um, it is this simple, except for more complicated transfer functions, the computations can get a little bit ugly. Let's take a look at the properties of the individual discretization techniques. To examine the properties, I will examine how the zeros and poles of a continuous time system are changed when the discretization is performed. First, we will take a look at the forward difference. To illustrate this on an example, I will use a continuous time system with these zeros and poles. The system with these zeros and poles will have this transfer function and this frequency characteristic. 
Now, when I perform the discretization with the forward difference, I will take this transfer function and I will substitute this expression for s, which will give me this. What will this do with the zeros and poles of the system? Well, if from this expression you express z, you will get this, and this expression says how the values of s, that is the points in the s-plane, are transformed into the values of z, that is the points in the z-plane. So what happens here? My values of s are multiplied by a constant, that means that they are scaled, and then they are shifted to the right by 1. So all the points in the s-plane, including these zeros and poles, are first scaled and then shifted to the right. Consequently, this left-hand side of the s-plane is mapped to this green area of the z-plane. Specifically, if your sampling frequency is 40 Hz, you will end up with this distribution of zeros and poles in the z-plane. And here you can see trouble. These two poles got out of the unit circle, so the discretized system is unstable, even though the original continuous time system is stable. This discretization did not go particularly well. Can we improve it? Well, we can. If we increase the sampling frequency, the sampling period will be smaller, and this scaling will put the points in the S-plane closer to the origin. Then, when you shift them with this one, you will get this distribution of zeros and poles. This system now has poles inside the unit circle, so it is stable. But you can see that the relationship of the zeros and poles and the unit circle is different from the relationship of the zeros and poles and the imaginary axis. The most distinct change is the position of these poles. These poles. Here, they are very close to the unit circle, so while the continuous time system had the frequency characteristic that looked like this, the discretized system will have a frequency characteristic distorted into this form. This peak is here because of this pole in the close proximity to the unit circle. So the moral of the story is that the forward difference can discretize your continuous time system, but it can turn a stable system into an unstable one and it can distort the frequency characteristic. Let's take a look at the backward difference. Again, I have the same continuous time system except now I perform the discretization with the backward difference. That means that I will use this substitution. For the sampling frequency of 100 Hz, the backward difference will transform this continuous time transfer function into this discrete time one. When I express z from this equation, I get this, and this is how the points in the s-plane are transformed into the points of the z-plane. It turns out that this expression transforms the entire left-hand side of the s-plane into this circle in the z-plane. To see why that happens, you need to crunch this mouse. You need to express the absolute value of z minus one half. For z, you need to substitute this, and when you express the real and imaginary part of s as sigma plus j omega, you get this. So when I put this together, I get this. Now, if sigma is negative, that means when I'm on the left-hand side of the s-plane, this expression will be always less than this one. And this expression you can put to a common denominator, simplify, express the magnitude of the numbers in the numerator and the denominator, and end up with this. So for all the points in the s-plane with negative real part, the absolute value of z minus one half is less than one half, which corresponds to the area within this circle. Moreover, when sigma is zero, that is when s is equal to j omega, that is when I'm talking about this imaginary axis, then this inequality becomes equality, which gives me this expression. 
and this is an equation of this circle. So the imaginary axis is mapped onto this circle. I do not examine it here, but the mapping is such that the positive part of the imaginary axis is mapped to this part of this circle, and the negative part of the imaginary axis is mapped to this part of this circle. This point corresponds to the zero angular frequency, and this point corresponds to the infinite angular frequency omega. Now, specifically, these zeros and poles are transformed to these positions. Note that here I have an extra zero, which you do not see here. This zero is here because this transfer function actually has a zero at infinity. When s goes to infinity, this transfer function goes to zero. And because this point corresponds to the infinite frequency, the backward difference will give you a discrete system with a zero at this point. Now, regarding the properties of the backward difference, since the left-hand side of the S-plane is always transformed into this circle, which always lies in the unit circle, the backward difference will always transform a stable continuous time system into a stable discrete time system. That is nice, however, the backward difference will change the positions of zeros and poles so that the frequency characteristic will become distorted. In this example, it is best seen on these zeros. In the continuous time, they lie on the imaginary axis, which means that I will have this zero in the frequency characteristic. However, because the backward difference transforms the imaginary axis to this green circle, these zeros will come to lie on this green circle and not on the unit circle. So the frequency characteristic of the discretized system will no longer have these zeros. This is no longer zero. So the backward difference retains stability, but it can distort the frequency characteristic. Now the properties of the bilinear transform. Again, I have the same continuous time system, and now, using the bilinear transform, I will substitute this for S. For this sampling frequency, I will end up with this transfer function. Now, when from this formula I express Z, this expression will tell me how the points in the S-plane are transformed to the values in the Z-plane. In this case, it turns out that this expression transforms the entire left-hand side of the S-plane into this circle in the Z-plane. To see why that is, you need to crunch this mass. First, you need to express the absolute value of Z, that is the absolute value of this expression. Now, when you substitute sigma plus j omega for S, you will get this, so your absolute value of z can be written like this. Now, if you express the absolute value of the complex number in the numerator and in the denominator, you will get this. Now, if the sigma is negative, that is when I'm talking about the points in the left-hand side of the s-plane, this expression will always be greater than this one, therefore, this entire expression will always be less than 1. So if the real part of a point in the S-plane is negative, the absolute value of the corresponding point in the Z-plane will be less than 1. Therefore, the bilinear transform maps the left-hand side of the S-plane inside of this unit circle. If sigma is 0 and s is equal to j omega, then this inequality becomes equality and I get this. So the imaginary axis is mapped to this unit circle. Here I will even examine how the individual frequencies omega are mapped to the normalized frequencies capital omega. When I am on the imaginary axis, s is this, and when I substitute this into this, I get this. Now the normalized frequency corresponds to the phase of the points on the unit circle. So the normalized frequency is the phase of this expression. 
And the face of this complex number can be computed as the face of the numerator minus the face of the denominator, which gives me this. So this is the relationship between the angular frequency omega and the normalized frequency uppercase omega. And you can see that when the angular frequency goes from 0 to infinity, the normalized frequency goes from 0 to pi. So the entire positive half of the imaginary axis will be mapped to this part of the unit circle. This point will correspond to zero frequency and this point will correspond to the infinite frequency. The bottom half of the imaginary axis gets mapped to this part of the unit circle. Now this mapping is actually a fairly nice property. In the continuous time, the frequency characteristic are the values of the transfer function at the imaginary axis. And in the discrete time, the frequency characteristic are the values of the transfer function at the unit circle. And with the bilinear transform, the imaginary axis gets transformed to the unit circle, so this should keep the shape of the frequency characteristic. The frequency axis will be distorted, but if I had a zero at the imaginary axis of the S-plane, I will have a zero at the unit circle of the Z-plane. And you can see that the frequency characteristic of the discretized system corresponds nicely to the frequency characteristic of the continuous time system. Therefore, the bilinear transform has the following properties. The stable system is transformed into a stable system. If the poles are in the left-hand side of the S-plane, they will be mapped inside the unit circle of the Z-plane. In addition, the bilinear transform keeps the shape of the frequency characteristic. These are the reasons why the bilinear transform is used for the design of discrete time IIR filters. Typically, you first design a continuous time system, discretize it with the bilinear transform, and that will give you your discrete time IIR filter with the frequency characteristic of the continuous time system. Now, let's take a look at another discretization technique called the impulse invariance. Let's say that our continuous time system has some input response h of t and we want to turn it into a discrete system that will have the same input response except it will be sampled with sampling period t sub s. Sometimes we also multiply the discretized impulse response by t s which gives proper scaling to the resulting frequency characteristic. Now to find the coefficients of a difference equation of this discrete system, I need to do the following steps. The transfer function of a general time continuous LTI system of order k looks like this. If the system has some multiple poles, you will have some higher order partial fractions, but for now to keep things simple, I will assume that my system does not have multiple poles. The inverse Laplace transform of the transfer function gives the impulse response, which for a general LTI system with single poles looks like this. Now that I have expressed the impulse response analytically, I can sample it at the multiples of the sampling period, which will give me this. Here, this will be my discrete impulse response, this will be a discrete Dirac delta pulse and these exponentials I can write like this. And these expressions into brackets I can denote as z sub p sub 1 all the way to z sub p sub k. Now when I take the z transform of this discrete impulse response I get this transfer function. And this transfer function I can always express in the form of a rational polynomial function from where I could read the coefficients of the system. And the system with these coefficients will have the same impulse response as the original time continuum system except the impulse response will be sampled. Now how does this transformation fare in the spectral domain and how are the zeros and poles transformed? Well, the poles of the continuous time system are this S sub p, and the poles of the discrete time system are this Z sub p. And here you can see how they are related. 
Each pole of the continuous time system is multiplied by the sampling period and then used as an exponent of this exponential. The Laplace transform poles will get transformed into the Z transform poles with this formula. Now recall the derivation of the Z transform and recall how we introduced that variable Z. We denoted that Z is e to the s times the sampling period. So this formula actually follows the exact relationship between the s and Z that we used to define the variable Z. So in a sense, this is an ideal mapping. Moreover, it is not difficult to see that with this formula, the left-hand side of the s-plane gets mapped into the unit circle. I can write this, like this, and this. Now, if sigma is negative, that is when I'm talking about the points in the left-hand side of the s-plane, this is less than 1, so this complex number lies within the unit circle. Thus, all the points with negative real part are mapped into the unit circle. However, this holds only for the poles. With the implus invariance discretization, there is no simple formula for the position of the zeros. The zeros simply turn out to be the roots of this polynomial, which is created when you put this transfer function to a common denominator. So even though the impulse response transforms the poles using this ideal relationship, the zeros can move all over the place. In the specific example of the continuous time system with these zeros and poles, the discretization with the impulse invariance and sampling frequency of 100 Hz will give you this distribution of zeros and poles and this frequency characteristic. Because the zeros no longer lie on the unit circle, the shape of the frequency characteristic gets distorted. So the properties of the impulse invariance are that it preserves the impulse response, however it can distort the frequency characteristic. A side note, this sequence of steps you can find for example in MATLAB, however it does not work particularly well when the impulse response contains Dirac delta functions. This typically happens when you are dealing with high pass filters. This is not entirely kosher, so as a consequence the high pass filters discretized by the impulse invariance method can get strongly distorted. On the previous slide, I have already mentioned that in the derivation of the z-transform, we denoted this exponential as z, which actually gives us the exact relationship between the values of s and the values of z. So if I have this relationship, could I not express s like this and then substitute it into the transfer function of a continuous time system? Well, I could do the substitution, but then I would end up with logarithms of z in the transfer function and I would not be able to do anything about it. What I could do is to approximate this logarithm with various polynomials or rational polynomial functions, which would give me the forward difference, backward difference and bilinear transformation techniques. Or, alternatively, I could use this relationship not for substitution, but to transform both zeros and poles of the transfer function. The zeros and poles decide the shape of the frequency characteristic and here I have the formula which defines the original relationship between S and Z. This formula has a nice property that it will preserve the relationship between the points in the S-plane and the imaginary axis in the relationship between the points in the Z-plane and the unit circle. When you examine this formula more closely, you will see that the real part of a point in the s-plane gets transformed into the magnitude of the corresponding point in the z-plane and the angular frequency in the s-plane gets transformed into the phase in the z-plane. And that is what you need. In the s-plane, the real part of a pole or a zero decides how close it gets to the imaginary axis, while in the z-plane, the magnitude decides how close a pole or a zero gets to the unit circle. And in the s-plane, the imaginary part decides at which angular frequency a pole or a zero will affect the frequency characteristic, while in the z-plane, the phase decides what normalized frequency will be affected.
So this formula preserves the relationship between the zeros and poles and the imaginary axis of the S-plane in the relationship between the zeros and poles and the unit circle of the Z-plane. Consequently, if I transform the zeros and poles with this formula, I should end up with a system with a similar frequency characteristic. Specifically, I can take the zeros and poles of the transfer function of a continuous time system and transform those zeros and poles like this, and that will give me this transfer function of the corresponding discrete time system. This discretization technique we call the matched Z transform. The matched Z transform has a tendency to keep the shape of the frequency characteristic. This is the frequency characteristic of the discrete time system created by the matched Z transform, and you can see that this frequency characteristic corresponds to the frequency characteristic of the continuous time system. However, for more complex frequency characteristics, the matched Z transform does not work as well as the bilinear transform, therefore the bilinear transform is usually preferred. And just to be complete, I will mention that the Z-transform keeps stability because all the points on the left-hand side of the complex plane are transformed into the points within the unit circle in the Z-plane. Yet another discretization technique is called the zero-order hold discretization. This approach is motivated by this setup, where a discrete system, for example a microcontroller, is regulating a continuous time system and the connection between the discrete time system and the continuous time system is provided by the analog to digital converter and the digital to analog converter. Now, we want to approximate this entire system with a discrete system. So it will not be only the discretization of continuous time system, but we will also include the analog to digital converter and the digital to analog converter. To do this, we need to examine how we can describe the operation of these ADC and DAC components. First, let's take a look at the sampling performed by the analog to digital converter. The purpose of this analog to digital converter is to take a continuous signal and turn it into a discrete one. Mathematically, if we want to sample a value of a continuous time function at a specific time, we can multiply it with a Dirac delta function. If we want to sample a continuous time function in a sequence of points, then we need to multiply it with a sequence of Dirac delta functions, time shifted to the positions where we want to do the sampling. So mathematically, we can describe the operation of sampling performed by the analog to digital converter as the multiplication of the time continuous function with a train of Dirac delta pulses. So mathematically, the sampled signal will look as a train of weighted Dirac delta pulses. Note that this is still a continuous time function. However, we usually do not go into trouble of drawing these Dirac delta pulses. Instead, we just use a sequence of discrete values which correspond to the amplitudes of these Dirac delta pulses. But working with a discrete signal in this form is mathematically correct. There are two points that should be taken from this. The first point is that mathematically a discrete signal can be expressed as a train of weighted Dirac delta pulses. The second point is that this operation does not introduce any problematic alterations to our signal. During sampling, the values of the continuous time signals are taken at given times and that is it. There is no distortion we would need to deal with. The situation with the digital to analog converter is a little bit more complicated. The digital to analog converter should take the samples of the discrete time signal and turn them into a continuous time function. Mathematically, we can represent the discrete time signal as the train of the Dirac delta pulses, where the amplitude or the mass of each Dirac delta pulse corresponds to the respective value of this discrete sequence. Now, ideally, the digital to analog converter would interpolate these discrete pulses with some smooth continuous function of time. However, this is not what usually happens. 
Your typical analog to digital converter will wait for an arrival of a sample from a microcontroller, then it will turn the value of that sample into voltage and it will keep that voltage till the next sample arrives. Then it will change its output to the voltage that corresponds to the value of the last sample and it will keep that voltage till the next sample arrives. This process will continue, so instead of some nice smooth function, the output of the analog to digital converter will give you these steps. This mode of operation, where the value of the last sample is held until the next sample arrives, is called zero order hold. So if we want to discretize this entire chain, we need to describe what that zero order hold DAC is doing with our signal. To be able to describe this behavior mathematically, we need to take a look at what happens when we feed a Dirac delta function to an integrator. This is not complicated. If I integrate a Dirac delta function like this, I will get a unit step. If this time is less than zero, this Dirac delta function will not contribute to this integral and the result is zero. If this time is greater than zero, this direct delta pulse will contribute to this integral and the result will be one. These results correspond to this unit step. So if I feed the integrator this direct delta pulse, the output will be a unit step. Now what if I feed this integrator these two direct delta functions? The first one is the same as before and the second one is time shifted and scaled. Well, the result will be these two unit steps with respective time shift and scaling. So if I feed an integrator to Dirac delta pulses, I will get these two steps and the size of each step will correspond to the weight associated with the respective Dirac delta pulse. The size of each step will correspond to the weight associated with the respective Dirac delta pulse. So using this knowledge, how can I describe a signal with these steps? Well, the size of each of these steps corresponds to the difference between the current sample and the previous sample. So to create these steps, I need to take the difference between the current sample and the previous sample, multiply that with a Dirac delta function, shift it to the position of the current sample, and then integrate everything. This expression will create this blue continuous time signal with these steps. And this is how we can describe the operation of an analog to digital converter with zero order hold operation. Now, this part of the equation corresponds to the operation with a discrete signal, which using the Z transform, I can describe like a system with this transfer function. The integration corresponds to a continuous time system with this transfer function 1 over s. So I can describe the operation of the zero order hold digital to analog converter by the combination of this discrete system and this continuous time system. The discrete time system will generate the weights, the amplitudes of the direct delta functions, and the continuous time system will perform this integration. So, in this entire chain, I can model the zero order hold DAC as the combination of these two systems, which are then followed by this continuous system, which I represent here by its transfer function H of S. Now, when I want to perform the discretization of this entire chain, I can do this using the impulse invariance. I will first take this continuous time part of the system and compute its impulse response as this inverse Laplace transform. Then I will sample the impulse response, which will give me this discrete time impulse response of this system. Then I will compute the Z transform of this impulse response, which will give me the transfer function of the corresponding discrete system. And last, to complete this chain, I need to multiply by 1 minus Z to the minus 1. And this entire expression will be the transfer function of a discrete time system obtained by the zero order hold discretization of this system. It is essentially impulse invariance discretization, but we take into the account the properties of the zero order hold digital to analog converter. Now a few notes about discretization of signals, which we call sampling. 
We have already talked about this. If this is my continuous time signal and this is its spectrum, then if I sample this signal with this sampling frequency fs1, I will get this discrete signal and this spectrum. Essentially what happens is that the spectrum of the continuous time signal gets periodically repeated like this. At least this happens when the maximum frequency contained at the continuous time signal is less than the half of the sampling frequency or if the sampling frequency is greater than two times the maximum frequency contained in the continuous time signal. In this case, that periodic repetition of the original spectrum causes no problems. The original spectrum is repeated but otherwise preserved. So in this case, with this sampling frequency, the sampling does not cause any loss of information. However, if you sampled with this frequency fs2, which is definitely less than two times the maximum frequency contained in the continuous time signal, you will get into trouble. Because the sampling frequency is too low, the repeated spectra will overlap and the final spectrum will be created by the complex addition of the repeated spectra. So now the original spectrum will not be preserved, it will be distorted and typically we lose some information about the original spectrum of the signal. So if the sampling frequency is less than two times the maximum frequency contained in the spectrum of the continuous time signal, you will get aliasing, which can distort the spectrum of your signal and you can lose some information. Now, you may think that you can find what is the highest frequency contained in the continuous time signal, set your sampling frequency to twice that value and you are safe. Practically, this is usually not sufficient. In real-world systems, your continuous time signals will not contain only your useful signal, but they will typically contain some noise or interference. Typically, you have some thermal noise, which can contain very high frequencies, or you can have some high frequency interference from wireless communications. Both noise and interference can be at frequencies much higher than is the maximum frequency contained in your useful signal. Therefore, you can sample your signal with sampling frequency that is twice the highest frequency contained in your useful signal, but before you sample your signal, you have to suppress all the noise and interference which is about that maximum frequency. For that purpose, we use so-called anti-aliasing filter, which is a continuous time filter typically applied before the ADC. Ideally, the anti-aliasing filter has this brick wall frequency characteristic where it passes everything below half of the sampling frequency and suppresses everything above half of the sampling frequency. In real life, such infinitely steep frequency characteristic cannot be implemented and you always need to have some non-zero transition band. And that can sometimes force you to sample at frequencies higher than is the twice of the maximum frequency contained in your useful signal.